Shalawamakyam wa akwath wa mashpaka. This is Pastor Jerry Carter III, and this is another Dabar Hakwadash Lakwak I Bar Yakwa lesson. Uh, let us bless our Allah Hayim at this time. Barakata Yahawa Baha Shem Yahawa Shai Hamashak Wa Rawak Hakwadash. The water Rabbah, Yahweh Haim, you allow us to come together one more time to worship you in the beauty of holiness. We ask you to be in everything that we do and say, and let your name be exalted. We ask you to destroy the work of the enemy, the evil hand that's in the midst. You have people that are sick and afflicted, sick and shut in. They maim, they halt, they lame. They have been suffocated and or brought under uh, extreme major illness. Uh, described as a disease, described as a virus, described as a new sickness, described as a pandemic. We rebuke the will of the enemy. We plead the blood of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach upon the enemy. We also ask that you touch and deliver your people. You have a specific chosen people that have been under these perilous conditions uh, for 2,500 years and some 500 years in this new world order system, uh, you have uh, people that are called Negroes, that are called Hebrew Israelites, and they are uh, the remnant of the seed of Jacob. And they have been suffering uh, perilous times for many, many years. Jacob has been in trouble, and it's time to be delivered from it all. You said in your word that Jacob's trouble will be at hand, but you shall deliver. You'll deliver him. So we ask you that you raise up your people that are under attack, a double and triple and quadruple attack from this enemy that's swarthing all over the world here. Uh, as we go into this topic, we ask you that you let this message reach each and every one of your people, all four corners of the earth, above and beyond what man can expect. Please put your word, this message, in the ears and in the hearts and minds of people that had no idea that this type of message was coming forth, but you had it come forth just for them so they could be healed on this day and this hour. You do these things for us, so be so careful for giving the name to praise. He's in all the blessing we ask. Ba Hashem Yahweh, Wa Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, Wa Rawak Hakwadash, the water Rabbah Shalawam. Lucifer, another name for Satan. Literally, the planet Venus when it rises in the morning. Lucifer, archaic, a match struck by rubbing it on a rough surface. Origin of the words, Old English, from Latin, light bringing, or morning star. From lux, or luck, meaning light, plus fur, meaning bearing, or fertilize, right? Lucifer, in one sense, is by association with the sun of the morning, Isaiah 14 and 12. Believed by Christian interpreters to be a reference to Satan, Hashatan. This is in the Oxford Dictionaries under the definition of Lucifer. He's, he's large, so it totally makes sense that you called it mm -hmm. Wee Jazilla. So you guys, monster. come on out, see this monster of a board. It's real, it's to scale. Planchette's huge. We can't wait to see you there. And thank you guys so much for watching and supporting us. And until next time, happy boarding. We'll see you in Salem. Asmodeus, asthma. Suffocate, strangle, hang self to strangle the Negroes, Hebrew Israelites, spirit of murder. A primitive root compared to Kanakwa or Kankwa, the ancient Hebrew pronunciation. To be narrow by implication, to throttle or reflex, 
to choke oneself to death by a rope, hang self, strangle, as mo de us, ash madahai, as mo dios, an evil spirit first mentioned in Tobit 3 and 8. Older etymologists derived the name from the Hebrew verb shamada, meaning to destroy. The spirit is at times reckoned as the equal in power of Abaddon in Job 31 and 12 and of Apollyon in Revelation 9 11. Nobody wants to lay on it because they were like, what if I begin to move? What if we move? I have a 1989 Lincoln Town Car hearse, and it was converted into a drivable Ouija board, the first one of its kind. Go to OuijaHearse.com to check that out, and you can see all the other boards I uh, made too. The reason I'm bringing all these up is because I'm running out of ideas. What What is there left to do? Where do we go from here? How about... The largest Ouija board the world has ever seen. I think that's a good idea. Let's make something so big that everybody will talk about it for a very long time. So, I gave birth to Ouija Zilla. Ouija Zilla is big enough to park five full size semi trucks. That's 18 wheelers to you and me. That's big, man. It's as long as a brontosaurus. You gotta Google it to find out how long it is. Some brontosauruses are longer than others. It's heavier than an elephant. It's heavier than an African forest elephant. An African forest elephant, because I was Googling, trying to find out crazy facts, is 6,000 pounds. We're at 9,000 pounds, so we have a 9,000 pound Ouija board. Is that big enough yet? Holy moly. The Talking Board Historical Society is going to bring this to you. We're going to invade Salem, Massachusetts, the place that inspired me to collect Ouija boards back in 1992. We're going to be on Salem Common, October 12th, Saturday. Come on out there, man. Do you got the guts to touch it? Do you got the guts to move the planchette? How many of us is it going to take to move the planchette? What do you want to know? You want to ask it Zilla questions? You ask it questions about Salem? Oh, is it going to open a vortex into the unknown? I don't know. Is it going to open a vortex into the unknown? I don't know. Open a vortex into the unknown? I don't know. So thank you for watching and subscribing and liking the content that we're producing here. Uh, there is another channel that we have, Gates of Heaven Quahal. Gates of Heaven Quahal. Make sure you go to that channel. You'll also see this content and uh, you can subscribe there. There will be primary um, ancient Hebrew lessons on there. So um, yeah, just uh, you'll see here this is what happened in Italy this is what they've done this is why there's so many people dying because they open up the vaults of death these people handled the dark angels the dark spirits all the time and their uh, phony holocaust they call it there was no there wasn't that many people of their culture their tribal people during that time had they done that killed off six million Jews then they there wouldn't have been any <laughs> any German of any of them German people uh, living right now because uh, there wasn't that many of them but anyway you know they're all there was just a civil war and the uh, the Vatican was definitely involved in it so pay attention 
In one week, the secret documents on Pope Pius XII will be revealed. Critics have long attacked the World War II Pope for not doing enough to stop the slaughter of millions of Jews during the Holocaust. One of the people who has fought to clear his name is Gary Krupp, co-founder of the Pave the Way Foundation, which helps promote interfaith understanding. And welcome, Gary. Your organi organization has done a lot of research on the actions of Pope Pius XII during World War II, including reading these documents that are coming out. You say you did a lot for the Jewish people. Can you outline some of what you found? Well, we, we've actually been working on this since 2006. Wow. And uh, we discovered exactly how the disinformation program, which was done by the Russians, start February, February of 1960, they started a dis disinformation program to attack the Roman Catholic Church and Pius XII to destroy his reputation. And the mm -hmm. fact is that everybody who lived through the war had one impression of him, but everybody was born after the Afterwards. war, and a lot of these so-called historians um, uh, had an entirely different impression. And this is something when we did, I grew up hating him. My yeah. wife and I are Jewish, and we mm -hmm. we we realized that uh, you know we were told a lot of things about him. And then when we started, because of our relationship with the Holy See mm -hmm. and with the Vatican, and, and um, we were shown documents and saw evidence that was incontrovertible. We just it was astounding. Like what? What did he do for? The well, Jewish I mean, it started from uh, from uh, from the early on, from the early twenties. Uh, we have the handwritten notes uh, where he w he despised Hitler and he called him a, a an un an, an, a, a scoundrel and hmm. capable of trampling on on corpses. He was warning the Vatican about this. Why do you think these documents have been unavailable for so it's long? It's not the it's not the documents. What mm -hmm. it is is the archives. Oh, right. The archives. Now, for right. example. Uh, what is now was the secret archives, which was really a misnomer. It was the, the secret was actually private, the okay. private archives okay. of the Pope, now called the Apostolic Archive. Mm -hmm. These are going to be open along with all of the archives, the Secretary of State, many, many, six of them, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, in the secret archives alone, they have um, over 16 million pages of documents of the Pontificate wow. of Pius XII <laughs> from 1939 to 1958. Now understand the canon law dictates that these cannot be made public until 70 years after the uh -huh. death of the Pope. And mm -hmm. what's the reason for this is that people who were named will be gone by mm -hmm. that time. Right. So the canon law protects these people. Well, with so much evidence proving otherwise, why do you think so many people are still critical of Pope Pius's role? Well, they the do because this has been an entire wave of information mm -hmm. that people have disseminated uh, throughout the years. Uh, I call it the worst uh, character assassination of the 20th mm -hmm. century. And Mayor Tse Tung said it best, a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth. And this has been the problem all along. So trying to convince people, hey, wait a minute, what you, what you, know, what you think you know is absolutely incorrect is difficult. Right, well, it'll be exciting to see that when it does happen. Gary Krupp, co-founder of the Pave the Way Foundation, thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So you want to know what the uh, the big problem is in Italy with all these people dying with this COVID-19, right? Uh, well, it's one of the most satanic countries on the planet. It's one of the most darkest places you'll ever see on world news. Let's hear about it. Because, take note, right after they opened their Jewish Civil War uh, um, Pope documents, the Vatican archives, they unleashed that unknown vortex and released uh, a Badawan, the angel of the bottomless pit, Asmodeus, the demon of suffocation. Let's see what they have to say over here. Johan Eeks, historical archivist of the Section for Relation of States for the Secretary of State, joins us now from Rome. Johan, thank you so much for joining us. So what do you expect historians will find in these archives? Well, uh, in the archives, uh, firstly, they, in our archives, they will find, anyway, the political diplomatical history behind it uh, of the war and after war and the Cold War. So uh, three moments, basic moments in, 19th, in 20th century history. Uh, very important also for America because America comes for the first time 
uh, with an acquaintance, a contact with the Holy See in the 40s, uh, with the special envoy of the President Roosevelt to the Holy See, and Myron Taylor. And uh, it uh, sounds really as a new uh, chapter in history. Well, Johan, critics say that Pope Pius XII was silent during the Holocaust. What did you find? Is that true? Uh, anyone, uh, everybody's questioning, of course, that. And um, I can tell you that in our archives, we have a series on Jews, and the Jews were helped by him. Uh, there were requests from all over Europe. These requests were not known until now. There were also very famous names between them, like uh, Paul Oscar Christeller, the famous Renaissance scholar who went then to America. There are also Liebman, uh, a professor of process law, uh, who later on came back to Italy and became uh, world famous on, in this field. Uh, these people were helped as young scholars to get out of Europe. Um, and these are only two of them, because many others asked for help and got it. I know another issue that arises in the archives is the Vatican Ostpolitik, uh, the dialogue and concessions that took place with Soviet countries. Based on your knowledge, did Pope Pius XII seek out dialogue with Soviet countries? Yes, many times it's said that uh, Pope Pius didn't love so much the communists and he didn't even want to speak with them. But uh, I think the opposite is true. Um, we will see that in these archives, uh, attempts to get into dialogue with the Soviets after the war will be there to be found. Find. Uh, and also uh, there are several secret missions also from Jesuit fathers to Budapest and other cities uh, in the East uh, countries uh, to get in acquaintance and in contact with the communists. Well, Johan, thank you so much for your insight. Johan Eeks, historical archivist of the Section for Relation of States for the Secretary of State. Thank you again. Thank you. And by the way, don't have any sympathy for this clown show that they call Catholicism and this Vatican of the Holy See garbage with these priests. This is the largest legalized pedophile ring on the planet. I have zero sympathy for them. And yes, I do have a tenure in... Uh, the Catholic school system so uh, I'm, I'm not speaking in terms of what I uh, assume or what I um, can guess at this is you know I'm speaking in terms of uh, my own uh, visuals of what I've observed of this behavior um, over the years and never have I endorsed or accepted or acknowledged or said it was okay all right so uh, just um, keep that in mind as well but let's let's hear what this what they're going to say about this genocide that's up and coming. The Vicar General of the Diocese of Rome has tested positive for COVID-19. Cardinal Angelo De Donatis is hospitalized and reportedly is in good condition. He's the first cardinal known to have the virus. They did not. So you see, this just came up just came up a couple of days ago all right the first catholic priest to so supposedly uh contract the coronavirus covid19 um let them go ahead and die um all of them okay from the pope the highest seat to the least seat um they opened that that dark bottomless pit unknown vortex and now it's coming back on them. So let it happen. You understand me? Let it happen. Nottis helps Pope Francis, the Bishop of Rome, with day-to-day -day operations of the diocese. Pope Francis sends a handwritten letter to the president of the Pan-American Committee of Judges for Social Rights. An Argentinian daily newspaper reports the Pope warned about governments putting economy before people. The Holy Father wrote, quote, this is important because we all know that defending people is an economic disaster. It would be sad to opt for the opposite, which would lead to the death of many people, something like a viral genocide. Father Christian Mendoza, professor of Catholic social doctrine at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross, more commonly known as Santa Croce, joins us from Rome on Skype. Father, good to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Owen. It's my pleasure to be with you today. 
Uh, we are seeing, of course, many governments around the world, ours included here in the U.S., you're trying to juggle the economy, health care. People are sitting home. They want to get back to work, Father. But, of course, lives are more important than jobs. And it's a very complicated situation. Is po Pope Francis worried about this? Obviously he is, but what's, what are his thoughts on this? Pope Francis has recently told that he is very happy with the governments taking big measures to assure the health of people. It would be a temptation to say, listen, um, someone who is very old is not going to live more years and economically is better just to let the virus spread and not doing anything because stopping the economy is a great deal here in Italy and also in America. But now the Catholic social doctrine, the church has always told us that humanity of, this, of a society is measured by the way in which to take care of old people, of sick people and of infants. So what is happening here is that society and the governments are taking care of what is more essential, that is life, that is human life. That's why the Pope is praising them. Pope Francis also warned about what will follow the pandemic. What could be some of the repercussions, Father? Well, when the Pope is speaking, he always has in mind what he usually calls the global south, that is those poor countries of the world, where what will happen is that, for example, a group of people may get together and say, we will get into the supermarket and we will just do violence there because we have no option. In wealthy countries like America, like also here in Italy, the government is saying, don't worry, you will be protected by us. In many other countries, this is not the situation. A different subject here, Father, and this is heartbreaking. Masses closed to the public. People can't, you know, they have to stay home. Uh, here at EWTN, we are offering, obviously, people the opportunity to watch Mass on TV, and, and it's a beautiful thing, and we're very proud to be able to help people. But, you know, we want, people want to get back to church, the physical church, right? What could be a solution for a diocese struggling to support themselves financially? If people aren't going to church, they're not putting money into the basket. Yeah, this is a big challenge for the Catholic Church, not only in America or in other countries where they are supported by what people give them, Think about the Holy See. Here, the Vatican is mainly supported by the Vatican museums. They're closed, and they've been closed for two months already and will be closed in the future. But what is interesting here is the church is going forth thanks to the generosity of many people. Now, with this situation, what we are experiencing is like a big train that stops. And so people are saying, what's happening? And they're trying to look at the window and understanding where are we going to go. This happens in society, this happens with the economy, and it's happening also with the church. It's a moment to think about others. This is a big opportunity for reflection. Father Christian Mendoza, professor of Catholic Social Doctrine at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Owen. God and they're wondering where you're going to go. You're going to go straight to the belly of hell because they have performed the highest levels of witchcraft and wizardry and satanic occultism. This is Jezebel working at her finest. Okay? Judaism is Babylon, the great whore. And Catholicism is Jezebel, her daughter. Okay? So now you get to see that this system, this beast system is collapsing and busting out at the seams. American popular culture is steadily being inundated with pro-LGBTQ messages. Marvel is pushing an on-screen same-sex kiss in a movie out next fall. HGTV has announced it plans to feature a thruple in its House Hunter series. That show will feature a married man and a woman who have two kids and are in a relationship with another woman who lives with them. And then there's AOC. The New York Congresswoman recently pledged allegiance to the drag on RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars show. I'm Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I pledge allegiance to the drag. Here to set us straight on these cultural influences from the LGBTQ community is George Carneal. Raised by a Southern Baptist minister, Mr. Cornell spent 25 years immersed in the homosexual lifestyle.
He is author of the new book, From Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. So George, tell us, why is this onslaught from the LGBTQ community occurring in our culture at this time? It seems they've gone from fighting for societal tolerance to indoctrination, demanding that uh, our culture embrace a minority lifestyle. I think it's going to continue to get worse. I knew when they opened the floodgates, it's never going to be enough really until we look at the bigger picture of what the agenda is really about. And that is silencing Christians and all opposition to this agenda and anything that is pro-family, pro-Christian, pro-life, pro-America. Uh, it's just an agenda that's going to keep going until they can silence everyone. Well, ex explain to us then, how is it that you, uh, raised by a Southern Baptist minister, a father, uh, came to embrace a gay lifestyle? Well, my journey was uh, I really struggled with a lot of um, bullying when I was a kid. There was a disconnect with my male peers, and because of the demands of my father's ministry, and he wasn't around a lot, I think there was something in me that was missing male affection and male bonding. So when I first, and I went through a lot of bullying, so when I first... Let's stop that right there. He's lying. That's all it is. It's a lie. I was bullied. I was bullied from kindergarten all the way to seventh grade. I was bullied for seven, eight years of my life. I grew up in a household where my father was a pastor. Not one time did I hear or get into tolerating this LBGTQ nonsense because I was bullied. Okay? That, that's just, that, that he's lying. He did it because he wanted to do it. Okay? Let's continue. Stepped into a gay bar at 18. It was the first time that men were looking at me differently and treating me differently. I wasn't getting the negative attention, but it was a positive attention. And it really became addicting because for someone who really didn't have that for 18 years of their life, uh, I just quit quickly became addicted to that life and it just descended within three years. Uh, by that point, I was already battling drugs and alcohol, depression. I had a sex addiction. I was a prostitute and I attempted suicide and it would still be 22 more years before God would finally get me out of that life. There's a growing effort in states around the nation right now to adopt legislation prohibiting counseling that attempts to bring gays and lesbians out of the homosexual lifestyle. Your thoughts on that? Should we have laws banning conversion therapy? Absolutely not. The way they tell it, they, they act as if every counselor out there is doing harm to an LGBT individual, and it's not the case. I've worked with both secular and Christian counselors, and everyone has been respectful of my journey, what I've been struggling with, even my faith. I have not had anyone harm me, and I've been through lots of therapy with lots of therapists. What they need to understand is there are LGBT individuals who do not want these feelings and they want help getting that healing and wholeness that they want so they can have a family and children that is their desire. And they have every right to seek out whatever kind of counseling they need to get that healing and wholeness. The LGBT activists and even government, the government does not have the right to step in and mandate and dictate that we have to be saddled with these feelings. And let me address this issue. This is why COVID-19, Yahweh is allowing this heathen to destroy themselves. Simply because of these unclean, unsanitary behaviors. He clearly said a man does not suppose to lay with a man. A man not supposed to lay with a beast as with a female. A man not supposed to lay with a man as with a female. A female not supposed to lay with a beast as with a man. A female is not supposed to lay with another female as with a man. This is written in Leviticus 20. And also, these are the reasons why, right now, okay, this is not a article that's been out for the past 15, 20 years, 18 years. This is the agenda that they are pushing right now while folks are contracting so-called COVID-19. It's no different than contracting HIV, huh? It's no different than being than dying from HIV. HIV, you die a slow, a slow death. You wither before the people's eyes, but 
this COVID-19 is, is HIV on steroids. And here they're still trying to push this agenda, press this agenda in the people's eyes, in the young people's eyes. And this is our responsibility as parents to teach our sons to be alpha male boys and grow up to become alpha male men and teach our daughters to be ladies. Okay, to be young ladies, to be young virgin ladies, damsel according to scripture, and then desire to become a married woman, not to become a flim flam floozy or some whore walking the street. Okay, or some classy uh, slut. That's not how it works. All right, and and because of that so-called conservative mindset, you have people right now that are opposing it. And that's the reason why Yahweh Haim is allowing these heathens to destroy themselves. Because they're carrying on with heathenistic behavior, such as this. And I'm sure just like you, many gays, George, uh, you at one time uh, viewed Christians as intolerant enemies. So how should churches and Christians respond then to gay members in their congregations? For me, I really hated Christians. I had such a, a, a negative view of them, and I had really been hurt by them because a lot of them give the narrative that God created AIDS to kill the fags. God k destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah to get rid of the homosexuals. You hear all, hear all of the perverted stuff, and then they'll say uh, all fags are going to hell. And this really stole any hope that I had in my own life of trying to, to, to think or believe that God was really an ally. And it was really God slowly immersing me back into the church, but with Christians who truly had the heart of Christ that allowed me a safe place to go and just sit with them. And I wasn't harassed or bullied or mistreated, but it was sitting under the power of the conviction of the Holy Spirit of pastors who had the guts to speak the truth of God's word. And I knew that by the Christians in my own life who were loving and who invested time in me and poured love into me, that really gave me a lot of food for thought, and God started to expose the lies of the LGBT activists, including the liberal theologians who pushed the gay is okay narrative. And after I had to work through the lies and God deprogrammed me of those lies and gave me the healing that I need, it gave me the strength to walk out of that life. The Episcopal Church just ordained its first lesbian bishop, Bonnie Perry. Should people who are openly homosexual be in leadership positions in churches? Absolutely not. And that goes for heterosexuals who are sleeping outside of marriage or they're living with someone and they're unmarried. No, there is a godly, there's a way that we are supposed to live our lives that God calls us to do in his word. And unless we are meeting those standards, not that anyone's perfect, but we should really be really be doing our best to live a godly life because we are an influence on others. And not only that, we are representing God. So no, they should not be allowed. And finally, George, how should now you see right here at least he was honest enough to admit and identify that this LBGTQ community and this uh, uh, philanderous community they are disqualified from from leading any form of worship okay now uh, there there is another lady Okay, who was a civil rights activist, a lawyer, Yale University. Um, her last name is Murray. Um, she was of the LBGTQ community, and she was the first bishop or priest or pastor in the uh, Episcopal Church. Uh, not this lady that they're speaking of in 09. This lady is from back in the 1970s, 1980s. Her name is uh, Pauline Murray. All right. Pauline Murray was an LBGTQ priest in the Episcopal Church, the first one to be appointed in this satanic cult system. So, um, just you know, th this agenda must be destroyed. And Yahweh is not going to touch filth or allow filth to be brought up into the uh, into the kingdom the new kingdom so he let the heathen destroy themselves by their own lust the scripture says in Romans 1 that they burn in their lust and therefore they become reprobate meaning they don't have a desire to turn to Yahweh Shai Hamashiach but they have a desire to turn back unto 
that wickedness and try and incorporate the wickedness in a so-called church. Well, when they do that, none of those churches are legit churches anyway. Um, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, a bunch of churches that have all these different rules and standards and bylaws that are outside of the scripture. There's only one body of Yahweh Shai Hamash Yach. There's only one Quahal. There's only one ministry. And that's it. There's no other. Uh, and what is tolerated and what is not tolerated is written in the Bar HaKodash, the Holy Word. So therefore, anything else has nothing to do with Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. Alright, so all of this rhetoric that they're speaking in terms of is nonsense. And that's why COVID-19 is destroying this behavior. It's sweeping through and taking people out of here because of this type of behavior. Should Christians then respond to these LGBTQ influences that we're now seeing in movies, films, politics, culture? What's your advice? My advice is, is I know Hollywood is glamorizing it and they are getting, giving a sanitized version of what homosexuality is. But until you sit down and listen to the testimonies of every gay, lesbian, and transgender individual who has come out of that life, and you listen to the horror stories of what we've been through, and the reality of that life, which I share in my book, it's not X-rated, but I don't sugarcoat it. But the life is so different from what Hollywood and what the media portray. And so when a Christian affirms this, they think that they're doing the most loving thing, but you're not. You're not only hurting that individual, and you're pushing them into a life of where they're not going to find any peace, happiness, or contentment. But they are. you are pushing them into further rebellion against God. And I've seen the casualties of that life. And I'm warning Christians to stop affirming this. Tell them the truth in love. And just so you'll know, in the back of my book, I put all of the talking points that the LGBT activists and the Christian liberal theologians use. And I debunk that with scripture. So if you have individuals who in your life who are not willing to listen to this, give them the book or at least get it and familiarize yourself with those talking points. So when they do come at you and say, no, 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 it's okay you can give them scripture because they are not going to sit down and study God's word to get the truth for themselves. Okay, the book is From Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. George Carneal, thank you for sharing your time and insights. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. A CBS News investigation has uncovered a loophole that allows accused and convicted American pedophiles to escape justice by moving to Israel. So Ian Lee has been following this for more than a year and he traveled to Israel for this investigation. He worked And y'all wondering why Yahweh Shai Hamas Yach, why he prophesied that pestilence, pestilence which is Hach Debar, the words of the, the wicked cursed words of the heathen. Okay? Uh, also uh Magapa, okay? Magapa, it means the diseases that kill humans rapidly, okay? Sicknesses and diseases that kill off humans rapidly, which is what they call COVID-19 today, the virus, um, swine flu, all of these diseases, all right? Now, these pedophiles can escape, run from America and go and hibernate over in our Holy Land, our ancient Holy Land, okay? And you think Yahweh Shai Hamashiach is going to tolerate that and allow that? This is stuff that's happening right now, y'all. Um, we are responsible to teach our children and the oncoming generations, teach them against this unclean, unsanitary behavior. This is not Quadash. It's not holy, okay? And uh, you, you've seen in the other video that they're uh, infusing these new shows with Marvel characters that are um, embracing uh, um, homosexuality and lesbianism and bringing these programs and shows to the young people. It is our responsibility as parents to hone in. I don't care how mad your child gets and it doesn't matter how much your child tries to say, um, you know, it's all right because they're all we're all kids and you know nothing's gonna happen. No, it's not all right. You shut it down. You get on their case and you explain to them how wicked it is and what these things will do to them in their lives. 
and how it destroys them. Okay, and that is how you bring the rod of correction in the midst. And you use the scripture, apply the scripture appropriately. You don't need to listen to some homosexual guy try and teach your child about this, about come not being in that life. No, no, no. You need to be straight and, and teach your children how to be straight. Okay? That's how it works. Let's see how these <laughs> 2020, uh, uh, you know, um, pedophiles are uh, hanging out in Israel right now trying to hide out without having any justice brought upon their heads. They're avoiding the law and they're being protected by the Zionist movement. Okay, this is satanic in nature, satanic among people. Yahweh Shai Hamashiach is allowing this filth to destroy them one by one or by many. He literally advised that these are the times, these are the things that people are going to be doing during the time. Uh, uh, it's going to be like the days of Noah. When, um, it's going to be even worse where there's marriage and giving in marriage. Okay, where there's all kinds of satanic behavior going on. And he said, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. All right. There's no such thing as a wicked person that's breathing and breathing wickedness all day, every day. They're not going to make it to the end. The only end they have is the judgment of death. All right. And you are wondering why New Orleans is, is, uh, is is a ghost town full of rats right now um th that lets you know how much filth is going on there okay worked with a group that tracks people accused of sex crimes which estimates dozens of americans have used this loophole so you know he's six foot two we are on a stakeout pounds, looking for week. this man jimmy julius caro 48 years old and wanted on charges of sexually assaulting a nine-year-old girl in Oregon back in 2000 and a five-year-old girl in Israel in 2001. He's considered dangerous. But these photos are a few years old, so we don't know if he'll look the same. He yeah, remains you know, elusive. Sort of Previous direction. attempts to capture him have failed. Um, obviously, the fear that he would somehow figure out that anyone's looking for him and bolt. He just called his number. Shauna Aronson like, got a tip that Caro's expected at this clinic near Tel Aviv. Who's going to call the She's police, with JCW, though? Jewish Community Watch, an organization that hunts down accused pedophiles who flee to Israel from the U.S., exploiting a process called Law of Return, whereby any Jewish person can move to Israel and automatically gain citizenship. The ease with which pedophiles seem able to use this law as an escape route haunts victims like Mendy Hawk, I was eight and who says he was abused from age eight by a teacher at an Orthodox Jewish school in Los Angeles. So your classroom is right here. How does it feel being back? Um, I was very anxious and, you know, stressed coming back here. And a lot of memories coming through my mind. Memories of his alleged abuser, Mordechai Yamtov, who taught him Hebrew studies when he was just eight years old. So in the beginning, he would just rub me like outside of my pants. And then I would say, uh, well, three or four months later, he started going like in. Reaching down your pants. Yeah, it's huh? reaching down. Why did you feel like you couldn't tell anyone? Um, I was scared. I was ashamed. I mean, I just didn't know what people would think of me of the whole situation. Yomtov pled guilty in 2002 to sexually abusing and committing lewd acts against three other boys. He served jail time, but when he was released, he violated his probation and, according to JCW, fled to Israel with help from individuals within the Orthodox Jewish community. JCW tracked Yomtov down and confronted him with a hidden camera in Jerusalem, where he admitted to illegally fleeing the United States with help and using a fake passport to enter Israel. I was supposed to stay for five years in the same city. I was supposed to, uh, let's see, try to be on the side of I was supposed to go every two weeks to the police station. No. I didn't want to uh, and like I left within a week later. He had this message for his victims. I'm very, 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 very sorry. The other person in this video is Mayor Seawalt, the founder of Jewish Community Watch. He tells CBS News Yom Tov's case isn't uncommon in the Orthodox community. The same thing that's going on in the Catholic Church right now around the world, the exact same thing happens in our community. The rabbis say it's, uh, you know what, he promised he's going to go for therapy, he's never going to do it again. Boom, he's in another community. A few years later, he's at the same thing and we hear more allegations that the person continued to abuse children. 
and often those abusers end up in Israel. Rabbi Yehuda Oppenheimer says he unwittingly helped Cairo escape. There was nothing that raised any red flags up to the point where he was moving to Israel. Well, I wish I could say that, but unfortunately I can't say that. So he had violated his parole and, and now they were looking for him. He said that there was something in the past that had happened when he was young, but uh, nothing had ever happened since. I've changed and I'm a different person now, and, but you got to help me. I felt that I could trust him. So I wrote him a letter and uh, he bought a ticket and uh, he left. Caro is accused of abusing more children when he got to Israel. What was that like for you when you found that out? It was a punch to the gut. It was, it was, it was very painful. Rabbi Oppenheimer yeah. says the reason he came forward is to shine a light on the process to, of accused pedophiles to fleeing to help ensure it doesn't happen again. Back at the stakeout, an ambulance pulls up and a man steps out. It's Caro. That was definitely, definitely him. Oh my God, okay. The police are called and eventually arrive. His days on the run are over as he's led away. Did you assault the girl in the United States? No. Did you flee Israel because you assaulted the girl in the United no. States? Have you ever assaulted any girls in Israel? Do you know that you're wanted by Interpol? Yeah. There's relief as police escort him to their car. This So there you have it. This is what's going on right now. Right now. This type of behavior must be destroyed. It must be burned up. Okay? You cannot touch innocent blood and think you're going to get away with it. You can't run from pillar to post from one end of the earth to the other end hiding and you tampered innocent blood. Yahweh Shai does not play that game. Okay? These people are not Israelites by any means. Okay? The, if, if the scripture clearly says that there would be war no more. There would be no more danger. There would be no more torture. No more of these issues going on in our ancient holy land when we return. Okay? So that lets you know there's no way that this is fulfillment of the prophecy of the scripture that Israelites return to Israel. And this is the behavior that's taking place in this hour. In this hour. People dropping dead, walking down the street, laying out on the sidewalks, dying from this airborne virus disease. And these guys are running from U.S. to Israel, okay, hiding out so they don't get caught for their pedophilia's behavior, okay? This is, this is the reason why this stuff needs to be brought under subjection. The divine judgment needs to take place. Okay, divine judgment. The judgment of the land is not is not good enough, but divine judgment is. Marks the end to a months long manhunt. Oh my, oh my gosh! Oh my God. <laughs> Can I give you a hug? <laughs> I have something I need to tell you. Yeah. Okay. We found him, and he was just arrested. What? What? He was just arrested. Wow, oh my gosh. You might Amuna, not her real name, is the person on the other me? end of the line. She yeah. was a little girl when Caro entered her life. I was five year, four or five years old. Uh, my mother was on bed rest. My father's a rabbi, so he wasn't really home. Uh, he used to come to our house. We used to play games, and then it became sexual. I'm gonna give you a cookie because you do it so nicely. It's all about the cookie. It's all about lying and it's all about being so evil to a little child. He also threatened me. He would kill my parents. He would choke me. He would hold me. He would kidnap me. How did that affect you? A lot. <laughs> yeah. It affected my whole life. My whole life is around this sexual abuse and rape. Yeah. Amuna turned to therapy yeah. and art to help deal so, with the trauma. This is in my bedroom and my inspiration. She paints and writes poetry, but she's still angry that it was allowed to happen in the first place. What are your thoughts on him being able to come to Israel 
and flee the United States. It brings up a lot of anger and a lot of frustration towards the Israeli system. Shauna says the failure begins in the U.S. Why would someone want to help one of these pedophiles escape? Oftentimes there's some sort of community incentive. Either, either somebody owes them a favor or someone in the community, let's say an institution, has covered up for them in the past and they know that if this goes to court, there's a lot of civil liability coming down the line, you know, and, and it's going to cost a lot of money to a lot of people, and there's nobody wants to deal with that. Shauna accuses the Israeli police of not prioritizing accused pedophiles on the run. Why do you have to be the ones that do this? Because nobody else is. That's really, I don't have any better answer than that. And if you guys weren't doing it? Then nobody would do it. Israeli police told CBS News that, quote, the police coordinate closely with the Ministry of Justice and worldwide police organizations in order to find suspects overseas. Today, Caro faces charges in Israel. While back in the United States, the district attorney's office in Clackamas County in Oregon told CBS News they are working with federal authorities to secure his extradition. But Mordechai Yamtov remains at large. The district attorney here in Los Angeles told us they have not requested Yom Tov's extradition and that they had no other comment. Jewish Community Watch says that is the problem. If American officials don't try to get accused pedophiles from Israel, then they simply escape justice and leave children at risk. The U.S. Department of Justice declined to comment on specific cases, but praised their relationship with Israel's law enforcement, adding sex offenders have been successfully extradited in the past. Days after Cairo's arrest, Amuna confronted him at an Israeli police station. It was good. It was good to confront him. It was important for me to have that closure in my life. The healing process will continue for Amuna, but for many, like Mendy, the lack of justice means the pain continues. So there are two things JCW says could help close this pathway. First, better background checks on people moving to Israel. And second, more willingness from U.S. authorities to pursue the accused. So it certainly seems like law enforcement, both here and in Israel, are sort of busy patting themselves on the back on how well they cooperate with one another. But the Jewish Community Watch seems to be doing most of that grunt work, that on-the-ground investigating. Why do they say, the group, why do they say more pedophiles aren't being apprehended? So it, it's very complicated uh, when you leave the United States and go to Israel. First, they say that once these people uh, are wanted, that they need to go to Interpol and have that international arrest warrant put out for them so that the Israeli authorities can then start looking for them. Extradition is expensive, and a lot of these jurisdictions just don't have the money or manpower to really pursue them. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the Israeli side, uh, JCW says that they need to be doing more background checks on these people. Sometimes a simple Google search will bring up, especially if it's an Interpol arrest warrant, right. will bring that up and so that they can then know this person is dangerous, they should not be let in, yeah. or if there is an arrest warrant out for them, that they need to go and pick them up. And JCW says that there just isn't the priority to go and pick these people up, that they that the police don't, uh, don't have the resources there to go and look for these people as well. Mm -hmm. So it really does fall on JCW to track them from the United States to Israel. That's unbelievable. Um, does JCW also sort of believe that aside from law enforcement, there are sort of other elements of the community that need to work on this? Yeah, and, and that's another big part of this, is that a lot of the times these people have help. Mm -hmm. as help within the community, uh, people that help them flee to Israel. Sometimes, as uh, we saw with uh, Yom Tov, he, uh, he had help, according to JCW, to flee the country through Mexico yeah. and then get a passport, uh, an, a fake passport there to immigrate to Israel. So they These say- These are elaborate schemes. Th they are, and, and they need a lot of people to pull off. Uh -huh. And they say that there needs to be a conversation within the community about not protecting people. And, and that's where it's so important uh, to have Rabbi Oppenheimer, you know, come forward and talk about yeah. this and say, you know, this is something that is happening uh, and we need to address this. And, you know, and he said, we, you know, the one important thing is if someone comes to you, don't be so trusting. Mm. You know, look into their background, especially if there's someone who wants to immigrate very quickly, mm -hmm. you know take some time to make sure this isn't a person who's trying to flee justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a really good element to your story uh, because sometimes, you know, it's it's not everyone's bad. There's are good people just trying to help out and they find themselves sort of caught up in a bad situation. Exactly. Hey, Ian, it's really nice having you here, too. Thank Great you. Great to be here. Thank you. All right. Let us go into our topic at this time. When pestilence is at hand, call Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. The ancient Hebrew reading 
of that title is Ba Magapa Ba Yad Quara Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. That means in or when or at pestilence or at the time of disease, sickness and illness. When it's at hand, you must call on Yahweh Shai Hamashiach. You cannot call on any other. So let's see here. The word pestilence is defined on this accord. An illness affecting humans, animals, or plants, often caused by an infection. That's in your Oxford Dictionaries. Any serious infectious disease that spreads quickly and kills large numbers of people. That's in your Cambridge Dictionary. Under the definition of pestilence. So let us get understanding here. What you read in the scripture, in the Bible, as the word pestilence, that's not exactly what it meant. When you think it's something or someone who's just bothering you or aggravating you, that is a minor understanding of what it means. But the true understanding of what it means is exactly what is defined here. The word pestilence is defined as a serious infectious disease that spreads quickly and kills large numbers of people. Many of our people right now have no idea. They have no idea that Yahweh Shai Hamashiach prophesied that this coronavirus would be at hand. I have been asked questions multiple times by uh, individuals asking me, is it written in the Bible? And I share various, various verses of showing how plagues and diseases and things that are described in this hour uh, show them in the scripture. Uh, and by the way, those of you that have uh, chimed in and subscribed, thank you. Uh, those of you that are uh, asking questions, the water Bob, thank you very much as well. Um, those of you that are texting me and calling me in this hour, discussing these uh, topics and going over other content, it's great that you're, you know, one thing that's good about this, this uh, so-called pandemic is that it heightened the conscious awareness of how real Yahweh Shai is. Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, it made people, it's making people want to know more about him in this hour, especially when you got, you got put on the bench, you know, it, we call it riding the pine, you know, you got, it, it, <laughs> now you're a backup player, you know, <laughs> you got to learn how it feels to come off of the bench and play in the game <laughs> instead of being a starter, um, and what that means is, uh, you know, you, you're not out there every day, all day, and, and uh, putting your Hawashai Hamashiach on the back burner. Now, uh, you have to hear his word, study and read his word, and, and absorb, pray fast. You got to get into what he's been saying in his word, the Bar HaKodash, the Holy Word. So, there's nothing else better for you to do right now. All right. So that word pestilence is written in the Old and New Testament and is defined in one testament. The Old and New Testament is the same testament. All right. Uh, so it is defined as a illness or an infectious disease that's in humans, animals, plants, and often caused by infection. And it's also an infectious disease that spreads quickly and kills large numbers of people so the next definition of pestilence is found in your merriam webster dictionary under pestilence it's a contagious or infectious epidemic disease that is virulent and devastating especially they gave you an example bubonic plague well guess what one thing they did not put in here is coronavirus or what they call swine flu or what they call Hong Kong flu, Asia flu, Spanish flu, 
COVID-19, <laughs> Ebola, uh, Mars, SARS, <laughs> the typical uh, influenza that you get every year, cold season. These are all pestilence. These are all destructive, virulent, devastating sicknesses, infections. Okay? The second part of this definition is something that is destructive or pernicious. So Webster's Dictionary gives us another way of looking at the word pestilence. So let's see how it's written in the ancient script here. Get this understanding a little more in depth. You know, in the ancient script, we read from right to left and not left to right. And the words are broken down in the purest form. There is no other definition to the word. It's, it means what it means and that's it. Uh, we don't have to go to, you know, five different uh, um, versions of the Bible to figure out what the ancient scripture is saying. We go to one version. Um, you know, you can go from the King James Version, 1611, which I highly recommend. And uh, you want to have to get the King James Version, 16, King James Version, 1611, that has the Apocrypha in it. So that way you can reference those books as well. But uh, the key thing is you want to get the 66 books down packed and uh, you don't want to use the Apocrypha as a, uh, as, as a weapon not understanding what, what the Apocrypha is about, okay? Um, and there's a lot of people that, that, you know, conscious Israelites that so-called wake up and start reading the Apocrypha without understanding the primary 66 books and it sounds that when they speak in it it's, it's, it just doesn't add up so uh you know get you know, solomon said wisdom is the principal thing so therefore get wisdom and out of all of that getting get understanding so it's very important to get understanding get the wisdom of these primary books and then go into the apocrypha so you have some substance and sustenance to to keep your mind and your spirit from dwelling or uh, drifting into um you know artificial comprehensions so in the ancient script is defined simply as one word is this one word is that this word is that that word is that there you you won't see uh you don't you won't see one word with five and six versions of what it means <laughs> that's not how it works Okay, but uh, we're going to see what this word pestilence means. So you see here on the screen, we're going to go from left to right, and then we're going to switch up and go from right to left, and we're going to write this out on our tablets or our uh, pencil and paper, and we're going to uh, get into the vernacular of some reading and understand what this infectious disease is all about. So uh, we are defined... Um, since we've come to learn and understand in the Oxford Dictionary uh, and also in the Webster Dictionary and the Cambridge Dictionary, we've come to learn that uh, the word pestilence is something that is a very, very aggressive infection and disease that will kill you. Um, so this is how we give the breakdown. Pestilence is a mass infectious disease spreading quickly and killing humans okay it's not just a uh <clears throat> a pestilence that's killing uh you know a pestilence that's just killing off uh, uh animals but this is a pestilence that is killing off human beings and it's not doing it in a slow uh drawn out scenario this is a very uh rapid um scenario okay <clears throat> so keep that in mind so let's go to the uh, the next part here and you see the word pestilence it says Dabar and Magapa Magapa alright so in order for a pestilence of, of man made pestilence Okay, man-made pestilence, man-made disease, 
man-made sickness, man-made illnesses, for that to come forth, it has to be a, a curse of man. It has to be something that the heathen has done to energize sickness into the air or energize sickness among one another. Um, you see, <laughs> one thing when you practice the scripture, the Ten Commandments and the other uh, 613 law statutes and commandments you try and practice it to the best of your ability and you try to keep some good hygiene going uh, you you're not easily sick uh, you know Leviticus 11 chapter Deuteronomy 14 is a is very very important for you to consume foods on that accord so you're immune system is not easily broken um, your immune system can stand and withstand even if there is an illness you're not going to be destroyed in the time of the uh, pestilence or the time of the disease okay so let's go to this next part the next part you see is from right to left and you see the word debar debar means word it means speak, okay? It means you're saying something, all right? And that's what a pestilence, all right? An infectious disease. Someone had to speak these things or call these things or come up, come up with a uh, written idea of how they're going to make masses of people sick or ill, okay? Um... Magapa, Magapa is another uh, word for the illness and the disease, but it's a massive amount of people that are dying from it, okay? So those two words, you have to make sure you implement understanding that Debar means word, okay? Debar means word, and it also means to cause, you know, all right, witch doctors, voodoo. See, back in the day, our ancestors that was practicing voodoo, all right, and blood ritual sacrificing, they would speak words over you to cause you to be sick, all right? And that's why Debar is a, a primary word that's referenced for an infectious disease a mass infectious disease that's spreading quickly and killing humans all right because you have to speak these words out to curse people all right and that's a lot of people are getting sick and dying or they're becoming gravely ill behind this because uh their spirit is weak and what i mean by their spirit being weak is because you know, we call it being a hypochondriac, you know, or someone who's, as soon as the media puts out any kind of uh, information, they immediately reacting and acting upon it and they just, they can't contain themselves. Uh, you know, some people don't even have coronavirus or COVID-19. There was a, a celebrity that did not have COVID-19, but went and got the test four and five times and finally ended up with it. <laughs> you know, why do you want to go and get an infection? <laughs> who's who's trying to become infected with, you know what I mean? Come on. So, um, you know, much of this is, is not accurate. It's not real content. It is it's definitely... Uh, you know, building upon the 5G, 6G, 7G platforms, 8G platforms. Um, like I told you, I shared with you before, NASA is already on 10G. They're already on the 10th generation or the 10th dimension or, uh, you know, they're at a level of uh, speed of, um, you know, moving um, electronics, artificial intelligence. They are 13,000 times faster than any ISP on this planet that ISP means internet service provider so any internet speed 
all right any bandwidths or internet speed on this planet is none of them are faster than nasa okay uh so don't be fooled people they know exactly what they're doing to use this term covid 19 as the uh the guiding light for this pandemic um they use spanish flu for swine flu a hundred years ago <laughs> and now all of a sudden you know i already put these videos out over the past you know uh years uh even last year i put a video about uh, a lesson about uh the 5g and how they're opening up an unknown vortex and uh how they're looking forward to it with the ouija board um you know i i you're gonna see some of that i'm gonna, I'm gonna put some of that video um content in this lesson so you'll see that the you know th this stuff is well planned well orchestrated uh don't be fooled okay uh let, let's go here to our uh drawing apparatus and uh let's erase these ancient hebrew letters and draw them again so we'll draw that word actually yeah we'll draw that word uh dabar all right so it's dabar da ba and ra all right that is Da bar. Okay, and that word da bar. All right, da bar equals speak or it means word. Okay, so the word pestilence in the ancient scripture referenced as dabar, hach dabar, okay, that means to speak or the, 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 the speech to call up a illness, okay, to cast a spell of a curse on someone is to put a disease on them and kill them with that infectious disease and anyone who else is with them like a whole household of people uh you know to speak those words of sickness into the air and people die from it you know many people are dying right now just because the media is continually speaking covid19 <laughs> and people are panicking they're using the words. They're using debar. Satanic words though. Ra'ai debar. Evil words. Okay. Ra'ai is ancient Hebrew for evil. So they're using ra'ai debar. Evil words. To they're they're using that, that term to kill off people. Okay? Killing humans with infectious diseases. And some of it is not legit, but then some of it is, you know, there's, there's an airborne, there's an airborne, uh, um, parasite in these airports, in these, uh, aircraft. It's intentional. This is biological warfare, chemical warfare, germ warfare. Okay. Uh, this is witchcraft. And you can see that they, that that are involved are heavily involved you know um the there's uh doctors and stuff that are, they're using to be mouthpieces in the media and some of them shouldn't even be there speaking and uh in one of my other lessons i referenced nebraska medical school of medicine okay nebraska hospital school of medicine or their uh, nebraska medical center okay and also Emory Medical Center, um, Emory University. All right, these two uh, uh, college universities, their medical centers uh, are top tier. They are trained and they're already well prepared with PPE, which is personal protective equipment or proper protective equipment. They they already have advanced training in this. So 
all Donald Trump has to do is just contact Nebraska Medical Center or contact Emory <laughs> Medical Center. It's not that difficult. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm, I have a little chuckle in me about it because, you know, he's calling and signing off everything else except calling Emory University in Nebraska, okay, Nebraska University, call their medical center. These people are already properly trained. They can actually help uh, um, design, help engineer um, pre-existing use of PPE and, and help prevent medical staff from, from getting sick. Uh, and, and, a, and a lot of their uh, stuff that they're doing is not accurate anyway, you know, but you got to take time and study into what they're doing and um, realize um, a lot of this stuff that they have in these testing tubes and vials. You got to be careful, people, okay? Um, this a lot of this stuff already has poison in it, okay. Um, there, it, it, one one day I'm a, I might do a uh, I might do a lesson on uh, the dollar stores, okay. They got Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, uh, Dollar X, uh, Super Dollar, uh, Five and below. You know they got all these different dollar stores. One day I might do a, um, you know, a little lesson on uh, showing you or exposing the, the chemicals, the contaminated stuff that they put on the shelves in these stores, and they still put the same names on them, and and people buy them and consume them. So you're you're buying these the, the COVID nineteen right off of the shelf. Why? Because you're buying things that's that's weakening your immune system. And, and you're consuming it and then you get sick and then you die okay so um, you know many of our people you know I, I have uh, an uncle who's very sick right now and pray that Yahweh Shai Hamashiach raise him up uh, other uh, family members cousins and uh, um, uh, other church family um, they're in Connecticut, um, fallen ill. I cannot say that they have COVID-19. They just have flu, influenza. That's just, you know, uh, any normal influenza. It's just that the, their, their immune system is weakened to, uh, to this um, so-called flu season. Um, there's more than 350,000 people in America that die every year from influenza okay listen to what I'm saying this is statistically proven okay more than 350,000 people here in America die every year from influenza what type of flu virus is that that takes out almost a half a million people every year okay so my 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 uh, issue here is if we're gonna put COVID-19 on every every time somebody say they got the flu or they got a head cold and they're getting sick and they're getting dizzy and all then that means that um, you know They've been had COVID-19 way before 2019. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so, and it, now they just have a weakened immune system, whereas it's more difficult, more challenging to resist the, uh, the war in the body with the infectious disease. All right. So, you know, the thing is, is that we love our family. We love our loved ones. We have a, a passion of love for them. No one wants to sit and watch a family member die right before your eyes and you're not able to embrace that family member or to share words, some final words with that family member. But Yahweh Shai said, all sickness is not unto death. All right. 
And that's one thing that you have to stand firm on in this hour. You need faith. All right. How would I said if you have faith as of the grain of the mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain and tell it to be plucked up. OK, you can command the mountain in your life to be plucked up and planted into the sea or cast it into the sea, um, meaning to wash it away. Destroy this mountain that's in my life. Um, you have that authority in your words. That's why a pestilence is the using words, okay? Using words to cast a spell of illness upon someone. All right? Mass illness, mass infection, massive diseases that spreads quickly and is killing people left and right. That is that is satanic at a high level. All right? So, let's continue here. Uh, we can we can drift and go all over the place with these uh, with these reference points, but this is um, very very serious here to pay attention to what or when pestilence is at hand because it's not always Yahweh Shai Hamashiach who is. Uh, um, involved, all right? It's not the hand of Yahweh who's involved here. Let me tell you something. When Yahweh smites someone with with a with a, a curse or a pestilence, you're not coming back. Okay, and that's one thing that we don't have enough people in the Scripture speaking about, and. Uh, you know, you got to go to Exodus, the 11th and 12th chapter, and learn about the hand of Yahweh Allah Hayim. When he smites with a plague, when he sends death, the angel, the dark spirits, the dark angels of death, when he sends them to suffocate, you're not going to get away. You're not going to put on the ventilator and outlive it. That ain't happening. This is the reason why I stand firm on saying it's not Yahweh Allah Hayim's hand in the midst of this. This is the hand of the enemy. He's letting the heathen destroy themselves. And I will never ever turn my back on those words because I know what he put in my spirit to speak and help and encourage our people. And if you believe that, like I believe it, then you will be healed or you will stand firm and you will have the confidence in this scripture, confidence in life, to know this is not the hand of Yahweh working in the midst. This is the hand of the heathen. His hand has gotten out of hand. <laughs> it's out of control, and he's trying to rein it back in. Okay? This is the work of that Gentile heathen beast system. 